Have you ever read a comic book that was so atrocious and offensive that it actually was a chore to get through it? That is exactly what I went through with Howard Chaikin's miniseries Challengers of the Unknown, Stolen Moments, Borrowed Time, from 2004 to 2005. I know that sometimes I've been a little more harsh with a book or a movie than perhaps that particular story deserved, enough so that I was called out as being too negative in my reviews, but in this case, I literally cannot think of a single positive thing to say about this book. There's really no good place to start with this book, so I will start with why I bought it. I was in a mood for the Challengers of the Unknown. Not this team that you see on the cover, but the characters from the 1950s who were created by Jack Kirby. Many people see that team as a prologue to the Fantastic Four, and in a lot of ways there's truth to seeing them that way. They were a group of adventurers who all had a near-death experience of some kind, and they all decided that they should devote their lives to fighting monsters and aliens. It wasn't high literature or anything, but this was the 1950s, so it's understandable. Now, I'm not debasing the concept or the stories of the Challengers of the Unknown. In fact, knowing that there was a team of brightly clad adventurers who fought monsters and aliens, well, that's exactly what I wanted when I bought this book by Howard Chaikin. Instead, this book is, well, one of the worst comics I've read this year. Instead of wild, goofy science fiction concepts from the 1950s, this book is about an invisible society of evil conservative Republicans who secretly rule the world through business, media, and politics. Instead of the fun and somewhat silly adventure comics that embodied the original Challengers of the Unknown, this is about terrorism, counterterrorism, and all-around unsavory topics that I do not care to see in the fiction that I consume. Now, it is entirely possible that my venomous reaction to this abomination might have been a little bit lessened if I had just known that this book was ultimately going to bear no resemblance to what I wanted to read. Granted, if I had known, I would not have bought this book in the first place. Now, you might be saying, well, surely there's something there that connects it to the original team and series, right? And my answer is, no, not really. This is an entirely different team of people, and as I said, the threats that these people face in this book are nothing like what the original comic book was about. This book literally could have been called The Suicide Squad or The Secret Six, and I think either of those titles would have been just as apt as The Challengers of the Unknown. Heck, with all of the on-the-nose playing card references, this could have been called the Royal Flush Gang, and I think that would have worked. At least that would have made a little bit more sense than what we got. So getting past that the concept is not what I wanted this book to have, what else is so horrible about this book? I guess I should go ahead and talk about the art really quickly. Before reading this book, I was under the impression that I did not mind Howard Chaikin's artwork. Granted, I haven't read much of what he's produced, but he did do a Wolverine-Nick Fury team-up story in the late 80s, and that was a pretty fun and enjoyable story. So I thought this wouldn't be too bad. But honey, I was so very, very wrong. I don't know if it's that Chaikin has always been bad and I just didn't notice before, or if he was a great artist and he devolved into what we have here. But there are two major gripes I have with what Chaikin delivers here. One, all of the faces of these characters basically look exactly the same. Okay, that's perhaps just a tad of an exaggeration. The main villainess of this piece, I never would have mistook her for anyone else. But everyone else in this book, I often had trouble telling them apart from everyone else. Poor Hemplo, there are three gentlemen with black hair combed in just a certain way, and I could not tell any of them apart. Granted, one of them dies in the opening pages of the book, so I guess that leaves only two characters who I cannot tell apart. All that helps me is that some characters have different hair color from others. But this is made a moot point when our protagonist's heads are shaven so that the women look exactly the same. That is actually not my biggest gripe with the art. Sure, not being able to tell characters apart is inexcusable, especially when comic books are supposed to be a visual medium for storytelling. But that should just illustrate to you how worse the second gripe actually is. I am convinced, absolutely underlined convinced, that Howard Chaikin had recently taken a gander at Frank Miller's Batman The Dark Knight Returns and Batman The Dark Knight Strikes Again. 
and he must have felt like he should take the same approach that Miller used in those books and put it to use in this book. In 1986, when The Dark Knight Returns came out, Miller took a very innovative approach to telling a story. Batman is actually not on every single page of the book. Instead, we're being told events that permeate the world of Batman and the city of Gotham through the mouths of a few television news anchors. This served a few different purposes. One, we got to see the apathy of the people of Gotham through the outlet of the news and just how important the return of Batman really was. Two, we got to see Miller's own views on the different political views of the 1980s. If he exaggerates the opinions of someone on the far right or the far left, then we can maybe extrapolate just how he feels on those certain subjects. And third, we also got to see how other people who were not necessarily main characters felt about the events happening in the book. Miller continued this practice in The Dark Knight Strikes Again, though by this point he took it to a weird place, having news anchors who give the news while completely naked, and then others who are dressed in extremely, let's be charitable and say, bizarre makeup and clothing choices. But enough about Frank Miller, what does this have to do with Howard Chaikin and what he alleges are the challengers of the unknown? Well, Chaikin, for some reason, does the exact same thing that Frank Miller did in his two Batman stories I talked about. And while the news thing was new and exciting in 1986, by 2004 it is old hat and it forces me to roll my eyes and say, been there, done that. And while the news segments in the Challengers of the Unknown book do eventually connect with the rest of the story, I was never very interested in what was happening in these segments because, in my mind, when I would read what the news anchors were saying, I was thinking, this is a ripoff, this is a ripoff. And while Frank Miller had criticisms of both the right and the left in his Batman books, Howard Chaikin seems pretty clearly anti-Republican. Now, I don't normally like to bring politics into my videos because I know it can be a very divisive subject and it is one where everyone who does have an opinion thinks that their way of thinking is the only correct way of thinking. I've seen people on both sides of the political spectrum who think that they are better than everyone else and they will use every venue at their disposal to talk trash about the air quotes other side. Because of this, people on both sides of the spectrum annoy me to no end, regardless of their views. Howard Chaikin is like that one friend on Facebook who relentlessly posts incriminating articles and statuses to show how much of a group of black hats the air quotes other side really is. But when someone points out how his side thinks and acts and behaves, he conveniently ignores that. Not only is this immature and annoying, but it has no business being in a comic book. I come to comics and television and movies because they are forms of escapism. That means if the real world has political strife and conflict, then I don't want to see that in the comics where I am trying to escape from that very thing. But I digress. I was talking about Chaikin's art, right? Remember in The Dark Knight Strikes Again when those people wore the really weird clothes that took you out of the story immediately? They didn't really look futuristic but more like what people in the 1980s thought the future would look like, I guess. Yeah, Chaikin does that sort of thing here. We are air quotes treated to non sequiturs like a naked man with angel wings who is, I guess, the servant to the main villainess. We also have fairies who, if I had to guess, they are really just humans dressed up as fairies or something. Fortunately, this doesn't quite permeate the book like it did with The Dark Knight Strikes Again, but it is just present enough to make me realize that Chaikin just wishes he was Frank Miller and is trying to do everything in his power to mimic and copy Miller. So far, I've talked about the concept of the book being not at all what I wanted to read about, the political nonsense of the book, and the art. What else is there to talk about? I guess the story and characters is what's left. First, the characters. There really aren't any. I mean, sure, there's that team on the front cover of the book, but none of those air quotes characters actually have any characteristics or personalities or anything even kind of like that. I know I have talked before about what my creative writing professor in college used to say. Show, don't tell. This book is maybe the worst offender of breaking that rule that I've ever seen in a very long time. If you put a gun to my head, I could not in all honesty tell you a single characteristic or attribute to any of these people in this book. We are told all kinds of things. We're told that they have all served in some form of the military at some point. 
We're told what their professions are when the book begins. We're told a little bit about their families from before they went into the military. And when each character is introduced, we're even told things like, My name is Holden Cross. I'm an internet muckraker, antisocial gadfly, and all-around troublemaker. Wired calls me a man who is born to blunt the cutting edge. This is an amazing example of just what not to do when writing fiction. Show me that this guy is an antisocial gadfly. Don't tell me this in narration boxes. This is sloppy and clunky for one, and it is made worse when none of these characters are actually what they say they are in their introductions near the beginning of the book. Chaikin does this, I think, because he is incapable of writing characters who actually exhibit these qualities, so he instead simply tells us that they have these qualities, when in reality, all of these characters are bland and boring, and are just vessels who shoot lots of bullets with a grimace on their face. Now, maybe I'm being unfair. It is true that at one time, Chaikin mentioned that he worked in television, in addition to his career in comic books. I've read several screenplays, and I can name quite a few that have had the most sinfully boring characters you could ever think of, and I can only imagine that whoever created those cardboard cutouts expected that an actor would be fleshing out the characters and giving us some dimension in those characters. That's okay, I guess, in television or movies, but it is not okay when you do not have an actor there to flesh out these very boring characters. But he also wastes pages and pages of time and space doing this because this story has no business being six issues long. That brings me to the story aspect of this book. As I mentioned near the beginning of my review, this story is about a very large organization called Hegemony. This group secretly runs the world. They control the president, they control the prime minister, they controlled Stalin and Hitler at one point, and they control a very hard right-wing 24-hour news network that, according to them, allows them to control what people believe is the truth. These are our bad guys. Chaikin makes no bones about it. Everyone who is part of this organization is evil to the very core. Among controlling every aspect of the planet, their endgame somehow involves eliminating everyone on the planet who is not white. This is quite befuddling since at least three or four people working for this organization are not white. Now, we do see that hegemony is capable of brainwashing, so I guess this might could explain this, but at least one of these non-white people seems to have had a history of altering the news that goes out to the public on behalf of hegemony, so it is unlikely that he is being brainwashed. Now, it seems to me that such a massive organization that has its fingers in every pie on the planet wouldn't have a very hard time accomplishing any goal, right? So if this group wants to kill all of the non-white people on the planet and start over with what they consider to be the pure people, then shouldn't that be easy enough for a group this large? They control every government, they control the media, and they control business as well. And if they don't, then it's very likely they could just assassinate their way into controlling what they already don't. So why exactly haven't they already succeeded in doing what they want to do? We're not really told why. Anyway, the story begins with an explosion in California that kills over 10,000 people. It turns out that hegemony is not responsible. It's another guy, someone named Bishop, who is responsible. It turns out that Hegemony will kidnap physically fit people who the leader of this organization calls people who, air quotes, misbehave, and then these people will be brainwashed into becoming remote-controlled assassins. Bishop, the man who is responsible for the death of 10,000 people, used to be one of these remote-controlled assassins, and our group of people who I will not call the Challengers of the Unknown, because they're not, they are also brainwashed assassins. Now, the fact that Bishop and the protagonists of this book are all able to escape the brainwashing is never really explained. We're told that an electromagnetic pulse will cancel out the brainwashing, but we're also told that Hegemony has had a base on the moon since the early 1960s, so what's the deal with that? Either Hegemony is weak enough that something as simple and mundane as an EMP can neutralize their agents, or they are wealthy enough and powerful enough to have a city on the moon. Or, as this book would have you believe, they are somehow both. 
Anyway, all five of the protagonists are actually in the middle of this blast orchestrated by Bishop, and they somehow don't die. We're only told that the EMP will wipe away the brainwashing, but we are never told that any of these people are immortal, and in fact, three of these former agents die, so we know that they aren't immortal. So how and why did they survive the explosion? Because Howard Chaikin didn't know what else to do, so he chose not to explain it at all. Anyway, we don't exactly know why Bishop decided to kill 10,000 innocent people. He claims that he is having a war with hegemony, and that people die in war. Okay, yeah, but not to be callous or anything, but usually there's a reason. If the Nazis have to get from point A to point B, and there's a small town in the way, then they annihilate the town because it's in the way. It's horrifying and it is evil, but there's some reasoning behind this, as cold and monstrous as it is. But I cannot see any reason why Bishop blew up so many people other than it gets the protagonists into the story and he wanted to make the top guns at Hegemony mad. Well, it certainly makes me mad. Anyway, remember when I said that this book has no business being six issues long? The whole book is me trying to figure out who the bad guys are and the protagonist trying to figure out what's going on and then the protagonist basically trying to have some kind of victory against hegemony and settling for escape. Most of the stuff that we're all trying to figure out doesn't even get resolved until issue 4 or 5. This book could have been 4 issues long if it had settled for going for a more straightforward story and not wanting to waste so much time describing characters who don't actually exhibit those personality traits that we are told. Before I finish this review, I want to talk about what was maybe the biggest slap in the face, for me at least. I've read many bad comic books before. I am certain I've even read comics as bad as this one, although I am having trouble thinking of a good example right now. But this book goes beyond being a bad comic book. There are a few moments where this book actually does casually mention the original Challengers of the Unknown. According to this book, they were agents who, like the protagonists of this book, were bred to be remote-controlled assassins and escaped, also like the characters in this book. And so, according to this book, Hegemony then spent a great deal of time, air quotes, bending over backwards to keep those four occupied with wild fabricated fantasies. This is what is often known as an everything you thought you knew was wrong kind of retcon, and it is nearly vomit inducing. It is insulting to the creators of the original Challengers of the Unknown, it is insulting to the fans of that version, and it is really insulting to anyone who invested any kind of time or money into that version of the comic. Oh, so you like a story about a team of humans who fight dinosaurs and are kidnapped by aliens? Too bad, none of that was real. It was all orchestrated as a big distraction that these villains who are much less interesting actually put together. <sighs> this is what is so infuriating about the book. Don't get me wrong, before this came up near the end of the book, I hated this book. But I hated it because it bore absolutely no resemblance to the comic I wanted to read about. But then it actually swerves so that it can deliberately run over a turtle that wasn't even in its way in the first place. That's what's going on here with this alleged reveal that the original Challengers of the Unknown were basically just phonies who didn't really have the adventures that we've read about. Anyway, before this group that Chaikin calls the Challengers of the Unknown are captured by the agents of Hegemony, one of their group, a guy named Zack, he gets his head cut off. I wouldn't have even mentioned this because he is just as boring as every other character in this book, but then the remaining protagonists are brainwashed by hegemony, and you're thinking, okay, game over, right? But no, apparently, at some point when we weren't looking, this guy Zack hypnotized the rest of the team because, apparently, hegemony wouldn't even be able to get past his hypnosis. First of all, how does he know this? He is literally in the same position as the rest of these jokers. How does he have information on what hegemony can and can't do? Once again, this is because Chaikin can't think of a better way to get these guys out of a corner he has written them into. So he comes up with some nonsense answer to how they can escape hegemony. <sighs> 
Anyway, I don't think I have to tell you that this book is horrible and does not have something as nuanced as character growth or anything like that that you usually come to see in a story. Honestly, I don't have many more ways to explain how much I hate this book. I highly recommend you do not buy this book. Even if it is in a bin of 99 cent trade paperbacks, you remember Fido. Forget it, drive on. Even if you see this book on a pile of kindling about to be burned, you leave it, you hear me? This book is awful and it deserves whatever fate you think you might rescue it from. That's really all I have to say. I sincerely apologize for not being more positive today, but I felt if I spent something like a week slowly trudging through this piece of garbage, and it is the reason I wasn't reading something more enjoyable, then I should at least have a video to show for it, right? I think whatever I do in tomorrow's video will be much more enjoyable for you and for me. Until then, I hope this video found you well, and I will see you guys next time.